Hi, I'm Mary Fitch, and welcome to this lecture on what I learned from the Giants. Um, we planned this, when we planned this lecture um, early last year, we, we had every intention that this would be a live in-person lecture at the District Architecture Center, but now we've had to go remote. And um, because this lecture depends a lot on um, film clips, um, which are big files, we thought it would make more sense to record it rather than uh, make it based on uh, Wi-Fi signals. So we recorded this a little earlier this week, um, and, and I'm really, really glad that you're interested in the Giants, and I hope that um, you will enjoy this program. And uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me on email or on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Mary C. Fitch, because I'm going to be watching too on Friday. So again, welcome. The Giants of Washington Architecture is, is a series I started working on in 2015 because while we all enjoy a vibrant city, I wanted to make sure the people that um, made it possible weren't forgotten. In addition, for people outside the city, I wanted to, to dispel that notion that Washington architecture is all um, uh, federal office buildings with a, in, in classical form and center hall colonial houses. Um, that outdated notion persists even though DC has become one of the most vibrant cities in the country. For those of us old enough to remember what it used to be like, the changes in the city are nothing short of breathtaking but they didn't happen by some fluke. They happened because somebody, the, the people that were there really worked hard to, to get us to this point. All those people who are willing to take a risk on downtown, who believed in the city even when it wasn't fashionable or cool to do so, we really owe them. And that's why we use the term giants. It's based on a, a quote by Sir Isaac Newton that reminds us that even though we think we're head of the head of the curve, um, we wouldn't be here for, but for those trailblazers. If I have seen further, Newton says, it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I've had the great privilege to talk to six giants so far. Although the episodes you'll see on screen are only 15 to 20 minutes each, some of our talks have lasted more than an hour and I've done tons of research on each of my guests, but I learned so much during these conversations. And that means the most nerve wracking part of this is what gets left on the cutting room floor. If you watched all six episodes, it would take you about an hour and a half. And while I do encourage you to watch all six episodes, don't do it all at once. It's a lot to take in. Today's, today's lecture is just to give you a taste of each one of the videos in the hope that you'll go back and watch them in their entirety. Each has a different story showing a diversity of practice, approach, and style. And today's lecture is in two parts. The first introduces the giants and some favorite moments from each of the videos that make them unique. And then I'll show you some ideas and themes that cross over several of our conversations. Um, before I introduce the giants, I want to thank the people that made it all possible. We've had funding from the DC Preservation League, the Humanities DC, which is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the wonderful people at Juicebox Communications who helped us put this all together. So our first giant is Hugh Newell Jacobson. Even before I worked for AIA, I knew about his work. He was a rock star in the 80s and 90s, working for Jacqueline Onassis and Hollywood stars. There wasn't a shelter magazine or an architecture magazine you pick up that, you did, that didn't cover his work. And more recently, we had a discussion of his work not too long after we opened the District Architecture Center in 2011. And there were people in the audience that didn't know about him. So Hugh is the reason I started this series because I wanted to provide a simple introduction to an architect who's done such incredible work and influenced so many. So let's learn a little bit about one of his houses here in DC. While Jacobson has done many houses over his very long career, he's perhaps best known for the Monopoly House, a pared down idea of a house at once comfortable and starkly modern. He uses a simple gable roof, sometimes oversized, sometimes repeated, such as in this house that he called the three linked pavilions. 
just by looking at the front yard, you can see how playful his forms are. Using a leftover lot in a Washington neighborhood, Jacobson created a series of four structures linked by a deck. The simple house shape of the structures maintains the scale of the existing neighborhood. The staggered massing relates to a property line and a really steep grade change at the end of the property. All those views are pointed inward from the street, and so that's a really nice oasis of calm in the middle of a neighborhood. Now this was actually the place where all the other builders in the neighborhood dumped their dirt. So it was really the worst lot in the neighborhood. And look what he does. He creates one of the most spectacular houses in the city. Architect Richard Williams, who recently renovated the pavilions, likes to talk about their lightness of spirit. Modern architecture, he says, sometimes takes itself so seriously and how refreshing it was to work on a property that has such a sense of humor. And that's what people talk about when they describe Jacobson's work, how he's playing with form. As much as Jacobson has had this singular style, he also did some pretty amazing historic renovation work and designed affordable housing, all of which you can see in the video. So I hope you'll take a look. Um, our next giant is Coke Florence. Coke is responsible for so many buildings in downtown DC that we have a whole room dedicated to him at the District Architecture Center. Coke was not, is not only prolific, he's incredibly funny. In this clip, he takes me to task on a comment made by a juror. You and I once had an argument about a building. Do you remember the Sunderland building on um, 19th Street? Yes. And I uh, was quoted as saying it was a hulking building. And what uh, was actually, it was a jury that said that, not me. But you really took me to task for that. Tell me a little bit about um, that building and why it so offended you that it was, it was referred to that way. Well, in those days, I was working for Kai's, Lethbridge, and Condon the occupants of that building and designed by Arthur Kyes. New brutalism is much more like the FBI building. And if you talk about hulking, I think it hulks. But the Sunderland Place building, in my judgment, is refined with a good scale of window openings, subtleties, the slants on the window openings uh, were designed to receive the sun uh, and the sun's direction. And um, I always thought, and I think we all thought, that it was uh, basically pretty delicate and it wasn't too tall and it wasn't too massive. And so you were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I am glad to be wrong. And in fact, after that conversation, I, I, I went and looked at the building quite a lot. And one of the things that um, people sometimes say about buildings, particularly along K Street, is that they're like skyscrapers with the tops cut off because of our height limit. It, people aren't really right. building within that high limit. They're just kind of building up and, um, and lopping off the top. Uh, the, the Sunderland building does not do that. It is, it, is a whole, it is a whole piece of work. It is a whole work of yes. art. That's yeah. a good point. Well yeah. phrased. Cook's whole video is a lot of fun. If you've been curious at all about the, how, what it was like to practice architecture in the 1960s, you want to be sure to watch, if only to learn how architects managed to practice after a two or three martini lunch. Um, Amy Weinstein is our third giant. Um, and she's part of a family dynasty of architecture. Her father uh, was a partner at Berla and Abel and was president of our chapter. She's married to Phil Essikoff, who uh, actually practiced with Coke for a while. And, um, and Phil is known for his wavy brick buildings. And their son, Jacob, is also an architect. Amy had her own firm for many years and has a distinctive color sense and flair for brick. Talk to me about, I mean, you, you use brick, which is a classic Washington material, but you use it in such a different way with a, with a lot of color. What inspired you to do that? Well, my first job when I graduated from architecture school at Penn was with the office of Venturi, Rauch, and Scott Brown. It later became Venturi, Scott Brown. At that time, Bob Venturi was experimenting with brick. They were doing a lot of lab buildings on campuses up and down the East Coast, which were ribbon windows with then continuous spandrels. And he started to look at brick as a, a way to bring a reference to the past into mo very modern buildings. You know, strip windows, sp long spandrels are, was very modern. 
um, but using a Flemish bond brick pattern and l allowing it to be seen by the coloration of the bricks was new. And so I actually you know, trained my, on my construction document <laughs> on buildings like that. So I learned how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to Washington and started to work on, for example, Capitol Hill, which is essentially a brick yeah, historic right. district, it seemed an appropriate medium. And um, I still love to use brick because it's still laid by hand, usually. <laughs> and um, you really get the sense of a human being, a mason, building the building you live or work in, bit by bit, placing one on top of the other. Along with that incredible style, Amy is also credited with changing the way Washington and perhaps the whole country thinks about public housing. Listen to how the Ellen Wilson dwellings were designed. I've always tried to be both modern and refer back to history, except for one project, the Hope Six project on Capitol Hill, which was a public housing. And back then in the late 80s, public housing architecture had a horrible reputation and it looked horrible. My clients really felt that the buildings, the houses should not look modern. My goal was to destigmatize this site, which is right in the heart of historic Capitol Hill. Um, we were tearing down the flat roof modern buildings and it had been abandoned in 1987 as public housing by the city and it was festering and right. you know an eyesore and the project started where residents of the Capitol Hill community came to me and asked me if I would do some pro bono sketches of what could be done with the Ellen Wilson site that they could then take to the housing authority and see if they could get some movement right to, and, and the housing authority was like go away uh, we're not we're not interested right, right. We can't, we can't do anything. But I do remember standing on the street with the community people around me and we were looking at the abandoned public housing and someone said, well, can't you just put like peaked roofs on it? And I thought, well, that's gonna look just as strange here as right. you know. And then I thought, well, why is it that we stigmatize public housing to not look like the rest of the community right. that it's built in? And I think there probably were political reasons for that way back when. But I said, why can't we just tear this down and build what looks like Capitol Hill so you can't see the boundary between right. this project and the rest? And that became the mantra for the whole project. Mary Airlines' name and firm are synonymous with historic preservation in DC. It's hard to think of a building in downtown DC that she hasn't had her fingers in. But Mary doesn't just look at architectural form. She looks at the details. She looks at the materials. Listen as she talks about her work at St. Matthew's Cathedral. That's another thing I wanted to talk to you about. You're not just doing historic preservation. You get into the technical details of how things are built. You get into the, these processes that um, most design architects are not going to get down in the weeds, literally the way that you do. And right. why does that appeal to you? Um, because clearly uh, you've been doing this for, uh, for some time in that right. way. Why, right. why, does, why do the details um, matter to you? It's kind of the same thought about, you know, how can you design if you don't understand what's been done before? How can you, how can you do a restoration? How can you preserve stone if you don't understand how it fails or why it fails? Or how to mitigate that process? So, so it really is, yes, understanding the materials. I mean, stone and metals are my thing. So I, I was really taken by what you had to do for St. Matthew's Cathedral. I mean, it needed major exterior repair, the roof was leaking, and then you were all the way down to the way the mosaics are done. Right. Um, that, that just seems to be, that, that seems like a, it's an awful lot of fun too, because you're not, yeah. you're, not yeah. uh, you're getting to be involved in all sorts of little pieces of the building. That was a wonderful project. Mm -hmm. I worked nine years at St. Matthew's. <clears throat> starting at the outside with the copper roof and working our way into the inside and in multiple phases. Every surface in this interior and exterior of the building was touched, wow. cleaned and repaired and, you know, loose tiles that were reset and uh, grouted and paint that was cleaned in a lot of cases. Uh, we didn't we didn't repaint if the paint was sound because a lot of it was original. It's such a wonderful building with so many different materials in it. I think it has <clears throat> has marble from all over the world. Wow. Wow. And you know, so every surface you touch has it has a different need. 
but everything was cleaned and repaired and it was a great project. Yeah, I was at a service there once and I was totally distracted by the <laughs> mosaics and I, I know. Marshall Purnell has been president of the chapter, president of National AIA and involved in so many big projects from the convention center to the baseball stadium. Here in the intro to his video, he talks about what inspires him. And I'm so delighted to have Marshall Purnell with me today. Marshall was a real rainmaker here in Washington. Um, he's done a lot of different buildings around the city, and he's been president of our chapter and president of the National AIA. But I should tell you, Marshall, the thing that I was doing as I was preparing for this, I was listening to Miles Davis, So What? And you, you've told me a story about um, how that piece of music has influenced a building here in Washington. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, before I start, I'd like to say it's, I'm glad to be here, Mary, and I feel old enough. I think Isaac Newton was a friend of mine. So, um, the Pepco building and songs. You know, my dad was a jazz musician, and there was a lot of buildings actually designed in our office over 35 years while the staff was listening to jazz. And it's been said that architecture is music frozen in time. And we, for many years, thought about can music inspire you to the point where you can design a building based upon a piece of music? And we start this debate within the office, and then we started thinking about it more and more. And you know, if uh, if architecture is music frozen in time, then a city is a symphony, mm -hmm. and a building is maybe a trio or a quartet or a quintet. You know, depending on the size of the building. Mm -hmm. So we got down to two songs, All Blues by Miles Davis and So What. And So What won out probably because of its name. <laughs> so. <laughs> Our final giant is Hani Hassan. I had wanted to interview Hani because one of my favorite projects in the whole world is the Red Star Line Museum in Antwerp. And he talks at great length about the immigrant experience, and I, I really encourage you to watch the whole video. In this clip, however, he's going to talk about why drawing um, is so important to his process. I draw to understand the building. Uh, and while I'm drawing the building, I began to sort of develop a, a certain connection there, uh, uh, almost uh, as if it is my original design or my original building, and that also develops a connection with the original architect. And uh, in so many ways, uh, I become almost very protective uh, to that existing building and, uh, and have great respect for it, which enables me to do the right thing. So I think you can see from these clips just how much fun this series has been for me. I mean, these people are amazing. Their careers are amazing and their stories are amazing. Um, and as I said at the beginning, one of the reasons these people are so important is that they understood the possibilities of what Washington could be. And um, in particular, Mary and Marshall both have recollections of what our neighborhood on 7th Street was like in the good old days. It's, there's a lot in this neighborhood that I've uh, had my fingers in. When we started the project at Gallery Road, the metro uh, was uh, was still under construction, was just <laughs> completing. The uh, shoring was still on the front of the buildings, holding them in place because they had started to lean into the street with the, oh with the excavation. Because this was an open cut for the tunnel here. Oh. Um, yeah, it was a very different place. There was no one here. Right. <laughs> Right. And now it's this bustling place yes. that we're Which happy to right. be yeah. in the middle of. Right. But Well, the tariff building, Hotel Monaco, yes. was vacant for years right. and really a mess inside. Lots of water damage. Um, Landsberg's was, again, just a, a pretty much an abandoned site. There was a lot of empty, unused buildings in this neighborhood. And now they're all really beautiful and people really appreciate them. It's an interesting neighborhood.
So you had a, a thriving partnership and you had an office over here yeah. um, in, uh, at, at a time when Penn Quarter was not yet Penn Quarter and was kind of uh, mm-hmm. a, um, an interesting area. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. um, how, running a business down here? In, that was, that uh, was, was that all early 80s? Um, 85. 85. We moved down here in 85. Mm-hmm. That was all by design. Um, we had gotten a job as consultants for the PADC, Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation. And we had that position. We were with Ted Mariani and Anderson Nodder out of Boston. The three of us were consultants to PADC for 11 years. And in being a consultant to PADC, we did measure survey on buildings down here. We actually moved some facades and along Pennsylvania Avenue, took them down apart brick by brick and moved them. So we were down in this area a lot as a firm. And we knew that what PADC was doing, we knew that this was going to be an up and coming area. Wow. And it was really the only way you could keep developing a downtown, so to speak, was come to the old retail downtown, which mm-hmm. is what this was at one point. Mm-hmm. So we figured if we got in early, and we did, we found this building at 8th and D, you know, and it had been vacant for, he had, the guy had renovated and he couldn't get anybody in it for two years. Wow. So we negotiated a 10 year lease with two five-year options. We wound up staying there 26 years, but when we got down here, it was not the best area to be in, you know, after work in the winter when it was dark. We'd have to walk the female members of our firm to the uh, metro or to their cars. There were a lot of male prostitutes around and just seedy characters, you know, around everywhere. So it wasn't the best place to be, but we could just see it starting to change. And, and it changed, you know, year by year. And there was the possibility of a new architectural style for Washington, something beyond tradition that Coke references. You started your career in Washington in 1960. You were you were practicing here, um, and who were the big architects in Washington at that time? Well, at that point, there were two leading firms. Uh, both were traditionalist. Uh, one was Faulkner, Kingsbury, and Stenhouse. The other, not so traditionalist, in fact, was Berla and Abel. And you may remember Jesse Weinstein, Uh and you know his daughter, Amy Amy Weinstein. He later became a partner in that firm. Uh, But in those days, it was hard to find a firm practicing contemporary architecture, as we called it at that point. And that's what I wanted. I was lucky enough to have gotten a summer job before going off in the Navy for four years with uh, Kai Smith Satterley Francis D. Lethbridge Associate. Good gravy, that's a mouthful. (laughs) Exactly. So when I came back from the Navy, uh, Clothiel Smith, uh, a firm then was Satterley and Smith, they had broken apart, uh, was the first to hire me. So your your interest in contemporary architecture, you still wanted to practice in Washington, even though uh, Washington in that time might not have been, as you said, uh, there weren't that many contemporary you know, I architects. Was deeply rooted as, as a native uh, in Washington. All my friends were here, so on and so forth, and I was quite certain that uh, I could uh, have a satisfactory career in spite of the sort of tension in those days between traditional and modern. But as you know, that evaporated. So uh, it's been a a great run. Yeah, you don't see that tension anymore between um, between traditional and modern. No, I think where traditional is now practiced, uh, it's done by experts who are interesting people with strong points of view. Hmm. And I think it's more a philosophical and stylistic difference. And despite the fact that Koch says that tension has disappeared, it comes up, even in these interviews. In Prague and in maybe in Antwerp too, but in other cities around the world, uh, historic buildings and modern buildings are combined. We don't necessarily do that in Washington. We tend to keep them as sort of pristine objects. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, Or disagree with me? Slightly. <laughs> um, I think it um, it takes a lot of research, a lot of knowledge, uh, and a lot of conviction 
to be able to really do the right thing, uh, to be able to convince uh, people to make that make that change. Um, so in so many ways, uh, it's okay to be protective to those uh, iconic uh, landmarks uh, that we have. They are really very precious to us because the history of the United States is relatively much younger than other uh, places uh, in the world. Uh, and perhaps because of that, um, it's even more precious because it's a younger uh, history and there is less uh, of it. So mm -hmm. maybe you become maybe more protective. But uh, every building has its own life. Um, I think uh, it is really not appropriate to keep the building uh, stagnant in a way. Uh, and not given the opportunity to have that sense of uh, continuum, uh, whether it's the same use uh, or a new use that gives it uh, a new life. Uh, and uh, we have done that here in so many buildings in the right way. The Carnegie Library is, is, a, is a perfect example of that. We, uh, we certainly give it new life. It's no longer the, a library per se, uh, but it's accommodating uh, uh, two tenants, uh, uh, two important tenants, very, very different um, uh, program. Uh, we pretty much uh, touched every square inch of that uh, of that building, and uh, it, uh, the building endured a lot of uh, deterioration uh, through the years since it was built in 1902. It's very very special for uh, not only for An Andrew Carnegie, but also very important for the city because it was free. It was a free uh, library. Uh, what is important now in, in this particular renovation and adaptive uh, reuse, it's now it's a place that is open to the public. Uh, I always uh, appreciated that building in so many ways because uh, if you look at it uh, today, it's really uh, a gem in the, in, the, in the midst of that green uh, oasis surrounded by mostly uh, glass buildings so it makes it even more unique and more uh, more special our giants have seen the field of architecture and by extension the chapter grow enormously i asked all of them about their hopes for the chapter and i think mary addresses that question the best we've seen the chapter grow from uh, uh, church street to here and now we're 2300 members um oh, good <laughs> what do you hope for the future of architects in washington and what do you see coming what would you like to see coming well, i think that part of the uh, i would say problem difficulty with architects and architecture is that people don't really understand what we do and so being here in a storefront, the public outreach programs, the foundation, which right. which we created to uh, to invite the public into our into our chapter, basically, and uh, to have public outreach programs is really important. School programs are also <coughs> critical because that's that's um, uh, teaching people very early what an architect is and what an architect can do or does, and encouraging people to to uh, engage architecture, architects, and perhaps become architects. So I think it's great. Great. All good. Keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so what have I learned in the hours of research and great conversations with our giants? Well, more than just a few things that have resonance for today. First, things get better. Um, Mary and Marshall both talked about the bad old days in Penn Quarter when no one was uh, there. And I remember working there um, at the Navy Memorial and, uh, you know, sort of having to hold my breath to get to the, the um, Gallery Place Metro to get safely home. But now, on any normal day, uh, 7th Street is just bustling. And I, I really believe it will be again. The second thing I learned from the Giants is if you can't figure something out, change your perspective. Um, Amy asked why public housing had to look a certain way. 
it seems incredibly simple, but it kind of changed the world. Marshall wondered if music could influence the design of a building and created one of Washington's best buildings. Hanny looked at an old library and saw a visual counterpoint to all the glass and steel around it. The third thing I learned from the Giants is don't be afraid to be ahead of the curve. Where would we be if Hugh Neal Jacobson and Coke Florence had given up and just followed architectural trends? They practiced in a modern contemporary style that wasn't popular and look what they accomplished. We are a different city, a better city, a global city because they paved the way. And finally, remember that everybody has a story. There are layers to people that you're only going to find out if you listen. That goes for your family as well as famous Washington architects. Being stuck at home right now might be a great opportunity to learn something new about the people you are closest to. So thank you for joining me on this brief tour of the Giants. I think you can really tell I enjoyed my time with the Giants and I hope you will too. All our videos are accessible for free on our website at AIADC.com or directly, directly through YouTube at, uh, on the AIADC media channel. In closing, I'd like to run a clip where one of our Giants talks about her appreciation for the changes in the city. Thank you so much for joining me today. So what, what kind of lasting impact do you want to have on the city? What do you want to see for the city? What do you, what do you most want to have happen here in D.C.? I once asked my father if his father could come back from the dead, what would he show him in Washington? And he said, I would take him to K Street because when my father was a youth, K Street were, was uh, Victorian mansions mm. from DuPont Circle area. Uh, west and of course in my father's architectural lifetime that was all torn down and the K Street office buildings were built and my father has um, passed away close to 10 years now and I thought that if I could have him back for one day what would I show him about his beloved city and I would take him to Massachusetts Avenue and north of that into Noma and that whole area because the L'Enfant plan was really just on paper and curbs <laughs> for his whole lifetime and now it's built out where the streets are spaces defined by buildings on both sides and it's it's just remarkable and really gives you such great confidence in the value of a good plan. <laughs>